Well, our next program is by, again, something, another returner. We have lots of people who have been back with us again this year, and this is kind of continuation of the program from last year. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Edward Jolie, and he's the assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology, Archaeology at Mercyhurst University. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday, they had their dig boxes and stuff for the kids over there behind the, uh, by the railroad station. So if you missed that last year, you got to come back and see it again next year. Dr. Jolie uh, specializes in the archaeology of North America, perishable ar artifact uh, technologies and applied anthropology. His, his academic interests are broad but focus primarily on the archaeology of the Americas, with particular reference to the southwestern and Great Basin cultural areas, Native American anthropologists' re relationships, and perishable technologies. Dr. Jolie is the director of the Perishable Archifact uh, Laboratory, which receives archaeology and historical items such as baskets, sandals, and textiles for identification, analysis, and documentation. A citizen of the Creek Nation of Oklahoma, Oklahoma Dr. Jolie is a mix of Sioux and Creek Indian descent. Please welcome back Dr. Jolie. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for joining me today and uh, braving this, this heat. It's pretty intense. I thought it was bad last year, and then I, I came in today. And fortunately, we've got a little bit of cloud cover, so I feel like it's cooled off. Um, well, I, I'm glad to be back, and I'm, I'm glad to be giving a talk like this where there's such great local interest and excitement for the type of work and research that we're doing. And so uh, what I want to do today is talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that we've been doing uh, through Mercer's University with the uh, Seneca Nation of Indians at Custaloga Town, uh, the, the reasonably well-known Delaware village, as well as the, the ultimate resting place of uh, the famed Seneca leader, Gaia Suta. Now, ostensibly, and, and from the title, um, it says Gaia Suta's War and New Insights from the Archaeology of Custaloga Town. Um, I selected uh, the title Gaia Suits' War because, as some of you probably already know, uh, in, in some circles and, and to some historians, uh, Pontiac's War has been uh, otherwise known as the, the Pontiac Rebellion, but also the, the Pontiac Gaia Suta War or Gaia Suits' War. And so my, my use of, of the, the label Gaia Suits' War was, was intentional. Uh, and partly because I want to play up and draw attention to uh, the efforts and, and impact of Gaia Suta, not just as a, an individual, as a, as a man and leader in the 18th century, um, but also the impact he has and, and, and the resonance he has for contemporary uh, Seneca Indians. And so uh, what I want to do is sort of foreground Gaia Suta, not to completely push aside the great Ottawa leader uh, Pontiac, but more to, to give particular attention and focus to Gaia Suta. And you'll see here I have also some of my, my collaborators and colleagues, uh, Annie Margin, who's actually sitting right back there in, in front of the camera, uh, gonna smile at me, maybe, unless I mess up, she'll, she'll hopefully obviate that for us. Um, Dr. Lisa Marie Maris Malishki, who was here yesterday helping with the dig boxes, some of you may have the chance to meet her. Dr. Mary Owak, the chair of our department. And of course, Jay Toth, the Seneca Nation tribal archeologist, uh, and our geologist and collaborator, Frank Vento. So uh, to provide a little bit of background uh, to the project, the reason why we've been doing the work at Custaloga Town, uh, a lot of it comes down to really um, Gaia Suta uh, and, and who he was and, and what he means to contemporary Seneca Indians. Now, as I mentioned, we're collaborating, working uh, very closely with Jay Toth of the Seneca Nation. And uh, Jay came to us a couple years ago with uh, a decided interest in uh, seeing what we could do to help him uh, protect and preserve uh, the burial site where Guy Suits is located on the Custaloga Scout Ranch, but also to help redress some omissions or, or neglect uh, of Seneca politics during this particular period. And I know historians in recent years have gotten a little bit better about um, rather than simply assuming that Native Americans were, were passive recipients of the actions of, of European settlers, um, but rather were actively negotiating uh, and actively and strategically working to uh, make a way for themselves in this dynamic and turbulent new social landscape. And so what it does is restore a bit of agency to who Guy Suta was, but also a little bit of agency to who Native Americans were on this sort of frontier in the 18th century. Um, they were actively engaged in, in doing what served their communities and interests best. 
And so it's a useful reminder to point out that at this particular time, what we think of today is, as Indian tribes, Indian tribes today in contemporary times are, are really ethno-political units. Okay, they're, they're political bodies. Uh, Indian nations are sovereign nations if they have federal recognition. And that means they communicate on a government-to-government -government basis with the United States government. Okay? Now, in this particular instance, what used to serve as historical ethnic designations or labels have come to take on a new political uh, and ethnic meaning and significance. And so it's useful to bear in mind that particularly this dynamic period of time in the, in the 18th century, um, there weren't tribes in the sense that we think of today, like the Sioux or the Creek or the Seneca. They, they were, but they were more like loosely affiliated bands in some circumstances. Now, obviously that, that doesn't quite obtain for the, the Iroquois Confederacy, which had a higher degree of, of political organization and greater centralization. But by and large, when we're dealing with the Indians that were living on on the frontier in the, the Ohio country at this particular time, uh, there's far less of that organizational structure in place. A lot of it dictated by shifting political and social alliances, uh, as well as kinship and familial relations. And indeed, that has a lot to do with why Gayasuta ended up spending so much time at Custaloga Town. The Seneca and the Wolf Clan Delaware, uh, who, to whom Custaloga belonged and was uh, among their leaders, uh, were, were prominent uh, in dealing with the Seneca. Uh, for many of their Delaware neighbors. And so they developed a very str strong close bond over those years. But of course, this is all sort of a, a backdrop to which the, the more well-known history that we think of when we think about Guy Suta is Guy Suta's affiliation and acquaintance with, with George Washington, uh, who he provided a, and guided on a tour of French forts uh, in 1753. So, Historically, it has a lot to do with the fact that Guy Suits has been affiliated with George Washington, okay? And to a lesser extent, his association with Pontiac and, and the Pontiac Rebellion. And what it has meant is that historically, there's been a focus on not just Guy Suta, the, the individual, but also uh, particular prominent places. And we see this uh, in history, we see this even in, in archaeology. A lot of the sites and areas that get a lot of attention are those places that tend to be associated with important events or important people. Uh, we, we expect that. It's not, not surprising. Those are things that uh, survive and remain in historical and social memory. But what happens as well is that people also like to use that as a bit of social currency. People like to say that, well, this particular event or this individual stayed here. Um, I, I think someone once remarked that the number of hotels or, or inns that George Washington or Thomas Jefferson could have stayed that, um, you know, would have kept them in a hotel for their entire life. Uh, people like that affinity to the past, that, that ability to sort of communicate with the past. And so for that reason, and I don't need to get too much of the details here, there are a number of different explanation accounts for where and why Guy Suits has been buried where he is. Some people say to the north outside of Pittsburgh, some people say on the Corn Planner Grant. But suffice it to say that when actually you dig into the historical literature, and this is something that really a lot of people haven't done, okay, is to critically examine the historical record and look at the actual evidence and accounts that are out there. And we find that the weight of the evidence suggests that a lot of these circulating stories are based on hearsay, which is to say they can't be verified or validated. There's really very little evidence to support them. They're largely conjecture. The fact that Guy Suta was uncle, maternal uncle, which is important in matrilineal Seneca and Iroquois society, was maternal uncle to Corn Planter and Handsome Lake, two of the other most prominent Seneca leaders of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, testifies to the impact that he would have had in terms of shaping their leadership skills and abilities, but also has fed some of these notions that Geisuta must have been buried on the Corn Planter tract, or that he could have been buried somewhere else. But in fact, Research has shown that there's good historical evidence, an eyewitness account, okay, recorded, written down, transcribed in the 1870s, that identifies the location site of Guy Suits' final resting place, somewhere between 1794 and 1810 at the Custaloga Town Scout Ranch. And so the map that I have here simply illustrates for the general location of, of what we're talking about, but also um, I point out that, that where Custaloga Town is, is indicated in that detail is actually further north than where the, the Scout Ranch is located, which is obviously down near Carleton. 
With this access to this type of historical record and the richness that some of these documents can provide, in particular some of the eyewitness accounts, we're fortunate to be able to access the map which was made by one of the uh, original Hydric family members who had training as a surveyor. Uh, and he produced this map showing the location of the core of the Hydric property, uh, in particular some prominent outbuildings, uh, roads, and also, uh, as indicated on the, the detail of the map on the right, uh, the location of the burial ground and village. And so Jay Toth, again, the Seneca tribal archaeologist, was very interested in what we might be able to say about the veracity, okay, the, the accuracy of this historical map and record. Now, on the face of it, we don't necessarily have any reason to doubt it, but we all know that historical records are written by people that sometimes have biases or agendas. So it's often useful and instructive to sometimes interrogate or question or investigate those accounts. And oftentimes, we're left with archaeology as the only means of doing that. Consider that archaeology uh, is a tool complementary to history, which relies on the written record. But archaeology, in many circumstances, the only means that we have to recover information about the past for which written records do not exist. So, literally, if you think about it, in broad brushstrokes, archaeology is the only tool we have to learn about the richness and diversity of our human humanity's past uh, prior to the last 4,000 years ago thousands, tens of thousands of years ago. Now, we also have the benefit of being able to access and communicate with the Seneca Nation uh, and gain greater perspective and, and interest into their concerns and insights. And the primary concerns and insights from the Seneca Nation perspective was, is everything where they say it is? And what can we do to protect it if it is? How can we preserve it? What can we do to get proper burial protections? for the burial ground. It's not a formal historic cemetery, so it's not afforded those uh, legal protections unless it gets registered as a historic cemetery. So part of the process that we're doing is not only sort of investigating some of these questions about what is there, what has survived, but think about it in terms of how can we best protect it? What can we do to protect and preserve the site for future generations? But also that it becomes a, a place to educate future generations of local citizens like yourselves, but also future Seneca children who should know about the efforts and successes of their leaders. Now, the historical account indicating that Guy Suits was buried on the Custaluga Scout Ranch uh, is, includes a richness of detail that I'll touch on in a minute, but has, uh, owing to a great deal of care and concern expressed by the Hydric family that owned the property, uh, has been successfully protected and preserved. So they themselves, the Hydric family, had done an incredible job of protecting and preserving the burial ground, okay, the cemetery. And we don't have good details on the number of individuals there, but more than likely we're dealing with at least a, a couple dozen people, okay? So we're coming at it from the perspective of we think these burials should be here. What might we expect to find? What other evidence do we have that it exists? And clearly you see how important this was to the family. There are uh, historical documents, surviving correspondence that uh, indicate uh, rage and aggravation that people were engaged in unauthorized digging at the site. And uh, the Hydric family really, to their credit, went out of the way to protect and preserve this. And so you see that manifested today in how the Mercer County Historical Society continues to take care of and protect the site. So we have putatively the burial site of Gaia Sutta, the famed leader. But we also have a suite of other historically intriguing features on this landscape and on the Scout Ranch. The Hydric House, built around 1819. Uh, you see in cross-section here the 1828 mill race. Uh, as, I, as I've learned, it's supposed to be one of the earliest in uh, this part of, of Pennsylvania. Um, I haven't explored that in any great detail, but if anybody here is an expert on mill races, please catch up with me after, after the talk. So there's a great deal of historical information imbued not just in the history and tales and, as you'll see, archaeology of the, the burial ground and associated village, but also the Hydric House, the Hydric family, and their contributions to the local community. As it turns out, we're not the first archaeologists who have worked at Custaloga Town. In the course of our research and Jay's research, we came to learn that during the Works Progress Administration, uh, a, a program developed after the Great Depression to help provide jobs to a lot of people, 
there were a lot of archaeological projects that were initiated uh, to provide work to people. And so at, at this particular time, there were large numbers of, uh, you might call them amateur archaeologists, avocationals, who were sent out uh, in the employ of, of the state or, or government, state or federal government to do archaeological research. And they found out a lot about these sites by a lot of the ways that archaeologists today learn about sites. They asked people. And actually what they did was send out postcards asking people to fill out information about local sites of historical or archaeological significance and return that information to them. So they generated a long list and then went, sent people out with teams to help dig and excavate these sites. So Harry Schof and his colleagues, who near as we can tell remain unnamed, uh, went out and spent uh, several days in early April of 1938 excavating at the site. They were familiar with historical accounts. They had access to uh, local individuals who told them where the site was. And of course, they had the convenience of the 1915 burial market that was erected. And, and that those first decades of the 20th century were a, a popular time for people uh, throughout the US to be erecting a lot of historical monuments and markers. We, we sometimes, I think, forget or overlook the extent to which monuments and markers uh, it's as much about uh, community building as it is nation building. People want to tell their collective history and story, even if they might be bending the truth or playing a little bit with the facts. So what you have here is a photograph, uh, courtesy of the uh, Pennsylvania State Museum, that Schof took during his excavations. And what we can tell as archaeologists think in terms of how they would have gone about locating the burials, they had a pretty good idea of where they should have been located based on the location of the monument and the marker. But they didn't know exactly where. So what you can actually see in this photograph is they're actually stripping off the upper several inches, or we, we use metrics, so we talk maybe 10 or 15 centimeters of dirt across the entirety of the rise where the marker is. And what they're looking for is stains, transitions and changes in the colors of the dirt that might indicate a disturbance beneath the topsoil and the grass. And they must have had some success because it led them to put in a, a couple of trenches, deep trenches. Now, there's no scale in the photograph, but we can tell from the current size of the monument, which is about a meter and a half tall, give or take, that they dug some pretty deep trenches. And I, I should point out to you that having with students and colleagues spent some time trying to dig through this, that would have been a pretty difficult trench to dig. They probably had to get out their pickaxes and really push through that. Uh, the organic rich topsoil is really in most places up here only about 15 to 20 centimeters tall. We're not down in the floodplain where the village is illustrated on the map to have been. We're higher up, okay? We're higher up on a feature that was created really by the, the, the receding glaciers. And so the soils are very, very thin and a lot of things washed down them. So it was hard digging. But here we have an empty trench, which suggests they didn't find anything or much of anything. A couple of other photographs illustrate that they did, in fact, find the burials. And uh, out of deference to the Seneca Nation uh, and the Delaware Nation, uh, who prefer that we not illustrate burials, uh, I've elected not to show those images. But we do have some surviving historical images of burials they uncovered. And lo and behold, what Schof and his team uncovered were three burials, OK, in close proximity to the monument. And you can see sort of the approximate location where those burials were located. Uh, and this appears to be a photograph taken after they completed their excavation. You can see the mounds of dirt over top of the graves and the, the large amount of clearing that had transpired uh, in the vicinity of the monument. That eyewitness account I mentioned from the 1870s was recorded by a man named John Martin who lived on and near the property for a number of years. And he was present by his account when Guy Suta and a woman and young boy were buried at that site. In fact, he helped make their coffins. And in his eyewitness account recorded in 1870, 1879 is when it was published, um, he talked about the things that had been interred, had been buried with Guy Suta. A kettle, a knife, a host of items that were included with Guy Suta's burial. The vast majority of these items were found by Schof and his crew when they excavated the burial of an adult male. So too did the age and sex of the burials and human remains in the other graves concur with that eyewitness account. So we have a high degree of faith 
in John Martin's eyewitness account. And not just that, but the fact that this is an account that was recorded very early on. There's not much cause or reason to suspect that he would have had reason to fake it. He lived in the area. It wasn't doing him any good. Um, he was simply there. It's, it's what he recorded. So it's, it's a relatively unbiased account. But again, archaeology provides with a set of tools and opportunities to be able to come back uh, and question that established historical record. And so one of the ways that we set out to do that initially in our first season in 2016 was conduct some remote sensing, okay? okay remote sensing is, in effect, uh, a series of techniques and methods that allow us to obtain data from a distance, okay? It can be aerial photographs, or it can be, in the case of, of our work, uh, ground-penetrating radar, uh, as well as uh, conductivity and gradiometry surveys. So instruments that allow us to, in many ways, create pictures of uh, electrical conductivity, uh, subtle shifts in magnetic fields, and also differential responses of the dirt to uh, radio waves that penetrate them, okay? Things that provide a, a, a coarse picture of what the surface looks like beneath the topsoil. Now, the limitations are that, one, we're not getting a really high-resolution picture, okay? They don't provide us with a, a snapshot. It's not like an X-ray or a CT scan, unfortunately. It's rather coarse. But what it does help us pick up on are anomalies, things that we might want to investigate. Now, in the case of, of the burial ground, our interesting concern was to see if we could locate anomalies that might indicate other additional burials. Well, as it turns out, we picked up several anomalies. But for us to verify that that's what they were, burials and not rocks or other features, we'd have to dig them up. And that's not really of any concern or interest to us. That's not what we're going after. But there is an anomaly that shows up on the map, consistent with the location of the burials that show found. And you can see some of these uh, anomalies indicated on the map. One of the, the anomalies on the lower left there you'll see is a real obvious one, one of the biggest anomalies. That's actually a segment of road that shows up very well in the 19th century map of the Hydric property. Uh, that road no longer exists today. Uh, the current road that leads you across Deer Creek north to the um, the powwow grounds and the rifle range on the scout ranch is uh, uh, quite different. Um, but this is an original uh, road that shows up, but you can't from the surface tell that it's there. So what that means is that in some circumstances, digging excavation is the only recourse that we have. Now again, we weren't interested in doing this at the burial ground, but we did solicit some help from a, a, a metal detectorist, a, a colleague who specialized in archaeological metal detecting. And he was able to help us uh, do some limited survey of the burial ground and locate uh, additional anomalies. And so really by concordance of data, by multiple overlapping sets of a data where there are anomalies, we feel like there are certain areas where we have a greater degree of confidence that these might be grave shafts. But again, given the depth, even with these type of instruments, ground penetrating radar, they're really not good much beyond about a meter and a meter and a half. And given the depth of those graves, it's really going to be hard to tell or verify anything without doing any digging. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't do any digging or excavation in the vicinity of where the village was supposed to have been located. Now, if you note it on the historic map, it showed it literally down in the floodplain. And so there are a couple things that I want to point out about this, because a lot of people say, why would you build your village down in the floodplain? Well, at this particular time, some of these villages were being occupied for shorter spans and shorter duration. So we think of a village, we think of there being one type of village or habitation. Or we think of historic uh, Native American villages after contact, you might think of a large village uh, located near a water source with a large palisade for protection or defense, either from your American settlers or other Native Americans. But really what you want to bear in mind is that there are lots of different types of settlements, lots of different types of settlement patterns. And in fact, what we see in the historical record, but also in the archaeological record, is that we see increasing use of floodplains, okay, for village sites or small scale habitations and communities. And it seems very likely based on location, the timing, and historic accounts that that's what we're dealing with was Custaloga. So you have to modulate or adjust your expectations of what you're looking for when you're looking for a village and not balk at the accounts that indicate it was buried in the floodplain. So we did spend some time in, in the first season down in the floodplain, uh, and the short is that we really didn't find anything. But we did make some interesting observation insights based into the uh, changing landscape, the geology uh, and hydrology of that floodplain. First and foremost, it's been very dynamic. 
We know from the hydric map, we know from historical photos, okay, that it was relatively stable surface as floodplains go. Floodplains experience uh, uh, seasonal flooding frequently. Uh, it's no different down here at the confluence of Deer Creek and French Creek. But what happens is um, you might get a, a large amount of water and depending on the type of flooding, uh, very little or a great deal of sediment deposition. And it appears that it's been rather moderate historically in this area. However, one of the things that we've noticed is that when you look at contemporary maps, North Deer Creek is this windy, sinuous uh, creek full of, of oxbows and bends and twists. Those twists and bends are not present on the 1930s aerial photos of the area. So what we know simply from looking at historical photographs is that the landscape has changed dramatically in just less than the last 100 years, probably owing to increased farming in the area and changes in hydrology brought about by damming uh, and, and modifications, anthropogenic modifications further upstream. All affect the way water flows down through French Creek and Deer Creek. And what that means is that there's been a lot of evidence for destruction uh, of banks of sediment and remove a lot of sediment and dirt. That said, we did dis discover what you see here indicated on the map as what we call a buried A horizon. A horizon is a soil term for a, uh, a soil horizon that's rich in organic material. And what it, what's of interest to us about a buried A horizon, as we call it, is that it indicates a stable land surface, okay? What you need and what's required for soils to form is a stable land surface. That means it can't be excessive flooding. It means you have to have a stable enough surface that vegetation is growing and is interacting with the soils and the broken down rocks to create that surface. We found this stable surface and we were initially excited. But lo and behold, as we acquired more evidence to begin to look at the artifacts that were coming from this deposit, they're too old. Ceramics that appear to be about 1,000 years old. So what we're getting was evidence for a much earlier occupation, okay, going back at least 1,000 years. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Native Americans have lived in this part of the country for at least the last 15,000 years. So we shouldn't be surprised that other people in the past have lived here or stayed here. And in fact, increasingly as I learn more about archaeology in this area, because I did a lot of work out west where it's very dry, not so wet, these vast corridors along French Creek and the Allegheny River and the Ohio River, they're all one big archaeological site. They were attractive to Native Americans and people for a long time for a number of reasons. Transportation, okay? Fresh water, later farming, and widespread availability of food resources, okay? Things that are attractive to people are, are oftentimes attractive to animals as well. So in the course of doing this work, we've expanded our research, okay? We feel very confident in the location of the, the burial and grave site. We're working with the Boy Scouts and the Mercer County Historical Society to put in place protections that will help ensure that it's protected for the future. But our lingering questions have surrounded to what extent anything remained of the village site. And we also had to do some testing in, in, in order to evaluate whether or not that map is historically accurate. And based on our correspondence between that historic map and what we've seen on the ground, we seem to think that that's a, a pretty accurate map, okay? Well, there's a lot of reason to find it incredibly reliable. But what complicates matters is, again, how much the landscape has changed. There are a host of activities that people have been engaged in since there was a village there. Widespread timbering and logging, planting of orchards and other trees. Okay, so beyond the forestry, we also have farming, widespread farming, okay? People modify and adjust landscapes. It's easier now with large mechanized machinery. So there's been a lot of landscape modification, and this has been particularly true uh, since the 1960s when the Boy Scouts acquired it. But that said, what we've got now is a pretty good picture of what the, the landscape and the archaeology looks like. What we see are a lot of uh, thin, ephemeral burn features, like you see in the, the upper left. Uh, this is a, what we call a thermal or burn feature. Could it be a fire pit? Maybe, but it could be some other type of burn feature. Heck, it could even be a lightning strike that struck the ground and burned or smoldered. Um, it did not produce a lot of artifacts that we would call diagnostic. There were some flakes of stone that suggest it's affiliated with Native American activity, but beyond that, we don't really know 
what it was used for. We don't have those diagnostic artifacts. Up close to the hydric house, we found some clues and evidence of the activities of the hydric family. A lot of this dating to the 19th century, bits of ceramics, some pieces of glass, and the occasional um, metal object. You see in this photograph uh, in the upper right there, uh, a pickaxe head, perhaps used for, for digging that really rough subsoil uh, up in the vicinity of the house. So by and large, by the end of our season last year, we hadn't found a great deal of material that dated to or seemed to correspond with the 18th century occupation we were looking for. Not just in the area where we'd expect it based on location on the map, but just in terms of everything we'd seen at the site. We had maybe a handful of period appropriate ceramics. Uh, we went and looked at the artifacts that had survived Schoff's excavations. Uh, it's a long story, but the, the graves uh, supposedly were, were reinterred at the site. Um, we hope and expect that he put the grave goods back in with the graves, but there's some reason to, to think that Harry Schoff might have been the, not the most scrupulous individual. He owned an antiquity shop in his later years. And uh, we know from, from some local individuals that some of these artifacts that he recovered were actually given to people. Uh, so we weren't really surprised when we got to the State Museum in Harrisburg and saw that the literal shoebox full of artifacts that survived from his excavations didn't contain a whole lot. A handful of 18th century beads uh, and a larger collection of 19th century ceramics, so a little bit too late. But those ceramics were probably affiliated with Hydric family and associated trash. Now, what we did notice last year and start picking up on um, was that sort of at the edge, the northern edge of the cemetery area, we were getting increasing amounts of historic artifacts, some of which could be based on the styles of ceramics, appropriate in age, so 18th century ceramics. We also found a, a one lone uh, pipe stem, but it was suggestive enough and it was mixed with flake stone artifacts, so the byproducts of, of flint napping, the process by which Native Americans and other peoples in the past have manufactured stone tools, they were found together, all mixed together. And I don't know how washed out the photograph is right now, but if it's really hard to distinguish, that's because it was really hard for us to distinguish in the field. And it really wasn't until several of these shovel test probes had been excavated that we were able to identify it in cross-section in the walls of our units. And what is instructive and useful about this is that it, it's a mixture that contains organics and tends to be darker than the surrounding soil matrix. It suggests an, a human or anthropogenic origin, okay? Humans, we can be messy. We produce a lot of debris and trash, organic material that enriches the soil, so it makes the soil darker. So we've taken to interpret this as a, 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 a thick, if heavily disturbed and mixed up organic layer that's, that's human in origin. And we were, at least as of the beginning of this field season, intrigued at the prospects of uncovering more period appropriate artifacts, things that might help us refine our understanding of the location of the village or determine what survived. And indeed, the last couple of years, we found a handful of intriguing artifacts. We have some ceramics that span late 18th century into the 19th century. We have uh, a lone pipe stem that you'll see in a minute. You'll see the stone tool on the lower right there is a gun flint. It's neither the French nor British style because it's Native American style. It's a Native American produced gun flint made out of locally available Onondaga chert. Now the other alternative explanation would be that this was a French or British individual who was really desperate for stone and flint and manufactured local material. But by and large, given everything else we found, it suggests that this was Native, Native American manufactured. And I like to point that out because it's associated obviously with flintlock, a gun. And these are the types of tools and implements that during this particular period of time when guns were getting increasingly widely available, um, people used to think that, well, the Native Americans weren't capable or interested in trying to repair and use these guns. But clearly they had enough knowledge to know how, how these guns worked and operated to be able to manufacture their own gun flints and more than likely based on archaeological evidence from other areas in the Great Lakes and the Great Plains were able to repair them. The projectile point you just saw, the arrowhead, the projectile point is the technological name because we don't know that it was affixed to an arrow. Maybe it could have been a spear, so we say projectile point. So that projectile point you saw in the, the previous slide and the one that you see here in the upper left, 
Um, these are two sort of short stubby styles. We've only found uh, maybe a total of three in our work here. Our lithic specialist, Allison Burns, who was here yesterday working with the dig boxes, um, thinks they're a little bit peculiar. And she thinks a little bit peculiar because they've been heavily reworked, heavily reused. They've been resharpened. Just like we resharpen our nice knives, they resharpen their stone tools. Now, for archaeologists, these types of stone tools tend to be, tend to be pretty diagnostic. That is to say that we can look at how they're made and determine perhaps how old they are. The problem is with these, they look like they could be later, they could be earlier. So the best we can do based on how these are made is say that probably in the last couple thousand years is how old they are. So we can't even be sure that they date to the period of interest, okay, the 18th century. We also see that we got in 2017 last year, and I, I think some of these slides are, are things I showed you last summer, were the remains of Aboriginal ceramics. Uh, that large shirt in the middle is a Native American ceramic that came from the, uh, uh, an exposed cut in the bank of Deer Creek. It wasn't one of our excavations. We were walking on the creek bank and saw it sticking out. And that was from that buried A horizon. So we know based on its location in the soils, but we also know from the style of ceramic that we're dealing with an early ceramic. Again, sort of outside what we're looking for. But Things got a lot more interesting this summer. Very early in the season, we recovered a suite of artifacts that have uh, amplified our understanding and use of the site. And what you see here are, are a selection that I, I've set aside simply to illustrate some of what we're getting. Uh, the upper left is the in situ or in its original place photograph of a piece of uh, copper. Now that piece there that you see in the, uh, to the right of the bead is uh, folded and snipped. You see above it the uh, uh, lug, or um, uh, lug is the, the term I'm thinking of. Um, what would have facilitated the wire uh, that allowed it to hang over, over a fire? It's a brass kettle, or excuse me, a copper kettle. Okay? So that hole would have received a wire that would have served as part of the handle, and that little lug would have been attached to the side of the kettle. So we had several pieces of copper, copper kettles. But most intriguing is that when we flipped over that one that you see with the scale in the upper left, you'll see it in my hand there. It looks folded. Let's see if the mouse works here. This one right here. They're folding it to tr transform it into something. It wasn't just a piece of, of copper kettle that had fallen apart and been cast aside. The Seneca and Delaware Native Americans that occupied this village were reusing it. Perhaps the kettle had burned out and was falling apart. And we have evidence to suggest from the multiple pieces of copper that we've recovered that they were snipping and modifying and recycling it on site. We have two brass hawk bells recovered from secure contacts that, again, fit the period. They're distinctive in the style that they were made. These appear to be British made. Uh, and I, I haven't heard them, but I understand from one of our colleagues that they still actually ring. Uh, so I'm looking forward at some point to, uh, to making an audio recording so we can find out what uh, a little bit of the 18th century sounded like. These copper and brass objects largely signify the trade products, the exchange goods, as well as the bead that would have been received by Native Americans in the area. And in fact, this is a big part of why Custalogos Town was successful here. During the period of time when relations with the French and or the British were going well, they could count on receiving large quantities of these valuable trade goods. Trade goods that not only facilitated the livelihoods of Native Americans in the village, but for the individuals, the diplomats and leaders who successfully negotiated them, could enhance their standing and prestige within the community. But we see in addition to acquiring these goods, we're also getting insights into some aspects of daily life. And perhaps what we're starting to think is that what we found and we think is the village may actually be sort of a, a, an edge of the village. And that really that might be all that has survived. And what we found is simply the surviving edge of the site, the periphery where we have what we might call an activity area, an area where people are actively working, breaking down or refurbishing metal objects. So in this slide, you see a, a reproduction of a uh, copper kettle of a similar style. The bent metal or folded metal piece that we recovered, and then another metal artifact that we found, a copper tinkler. 
used for decorative effect on Native American clothing for centuries. Uh, and I, I think this is a particularly interesting observation in part because Jay taught the Seneca Nation. Uh, when, when I sent him from the field, I, I texted him a picture of this in, in excitement. He said, well, this is fabulous because some of the other guys that I've been talking to uh, up here at Salmanca have been arguing about whether or not these copper tinklers were traditional, whether or not they should be worn on contemporary clothes. And here we have evidence from the archaeology of Kustelogaton that yes. Now, you don't just need the archaeology. Here we have a, a picture of the, the famous uh, Seneca leader red jacket. And he obviously has some tinklers on his garment here. Another pretty exciting find that sort of drives home what sort of activities are being engaged in by the Seneca and Delaware at Custaloga Town. She guess that reuse and acquisition of these types of metal objects remain an important part of what was going on at the village, at least into the 1760s. Our analyses are still ongoing, uh, but we hope to be able to pin down the age of this particular gun buttstock. You see on the left, it during the process of excavation, and then in my hand uh, shortly after we recovered it. And I don't know how well it's going to show up in these photographs in the tent here, um, but if, you, if you're able to, to get up, or, or maybe afterwards uh, I can leave it up, you can get up and look close. There are scratches, okay, and damages you expect on any gut buttstock that's been set on the ground. But they're also, towards the, the, the bottom end, you can make out some crescents, some half moon shaped uh, etchings. And I think they're actually the remains of some markings uh, and symbols or drawings that were etched onto the gun buttstock. And that was a not uncommon practice uh, for Native Americans to do that, and your, your Americans do that to their, their gun buttstocks. But hopefully also you've noticed that one corner of the buttstock has been scored. You can see the score marks and a square rectangle extracted from the bottom. They took the time and effort to extract and score out of the brass and cut a brass square out. Why? Well, perhaps for more ornaments. There's a historic painting of the other famed Seneca leader, Corn Planter. And notice the, the brass ornaments on his yoke. Strikingly similar in size and shape and appearance to what might have been removed from that buttstock. So we had a number of striking new discoveries. <coughs> There's one more that I want to mention to put things in context. But this is really as we move towards wrapping up uh, the end of our field work. We expect that in terms of addressing the questions that we want to be able to answer and address, how much of the village is left, where is it located, what are we going to do to protect and preserve the burials, these are, are things that we're going to work on in the future. But by now, we, we're thinking that the vast majority of our field work is, is completed and that there really isn't a great deal left of the site anyway. So archaeology is destructive, right? Archaeological sites are being made every day. New sites are being made every day. But in the process of excavating them, we destroy them. So we're destroying that record of the past. So any archaeologist worth their salt today does not have an interest in excavating the entirety of a site. You're destroying it. We need to leave something for the future. And if we don't have a need or cause to excavate it, then why should we? Let it be. So we have, I guarantee you, Several more years worth of talks where you can come listen to me talk about what we've learned from the analyses of the artifacts and further documentary research. We have a huge amount of work left for us. Not the least of which pertains to some recent discoveries of historic inscriptions and rock art in the vicinity of the site. Now, we've been working hard to do what we can to protect the location of some of these discoveries in part because um, We've been given cause to believe and know uh, from the ranger, Jeff Daly, that, that manages the Scout Ranch, that there's been some unauthorized digging. Uh, and this is destructive not only in terms of, of damaging the archaeological potential and historical potential, um, but because it robs all the rest of us of getting to learn about this site. And I mean, from a legal perspective, you're trespassing on Boy Scout property, and they will prosecute you. But aside from those facts, we also have to remember that at the Scout Ranch, it's not just one site. It's not just the burial ground. It's not just the hydric house. It's not just the sawmill. It's not just what might or might not remain of the village. It's the entire area and landscape. We're dealing with a larger cultural and social landscape. And for that reason, why we've been broadening out to look for other historic inscriptions, other examples of rock art. You see here in these images, illustration of 
what looks to be almost like a, a, a Bowie knife or, or trader's knife, uh, as well as what we interpret as a Native American-made depiction of a British or French officer, complete with pipe and bicorn or tricorn cap. This underscores to us that it's not just one site that needs to be protected, but this whole area. And so we've been working with the Seneca Nation, we've been talking with the Boy Scouts, the Mercer County Historical Society, about getting adequate protections, about getting this a spot on the National Register of Historic Places, but not just a spot as a site, the Hydric House, but a district. Something that recognizes the totality of the landscape, that recognizes the importance of not just the village and the burial ground, but also the Hydric House and the rock art and inscriptions. And we're just now beginning to get into the rock art and inscriptions. A colleague uh, has come out, and we've been talking with him about plans to do surveys. So there might not be more excavations next year, but I I'm certainly hope to be doing some survey, taking students and tribal members and Boy Scouts out, helping to look for and document this rock art. It's very friable. The rock it's in, it's been defaced by graffiti. We need to record and document it before it's completely gone. But not just that, we anticipate some unexpected surprises when we look at the names and recorded dates. The earliest I've seen so far goes back to 1832, 1838, but there are some faint ones that are in scripts that suggest they could be 18th century. So we have a lot left to do in the future. But even if our digging is largely completed, there's a lot more to understand in terms of landscape change and use. And so as we move forward into next summer, we're going to be focused not only in just additional archival and, and historical documents research, but we need to be thinking more about some of the, the factors that influence landscape change. What is it about the last 100 years, uh, in specific terms, have so modified the landscape, have so altered the appearance of the floodplain that it appears that the vast majority of the site and artifacts are pretty much gone? So we want to understand that landscape change because I think it's also telling us something about more recent human activity and history in this area. And I think that's something that's uh, of interest and value as well. And then lastly, uh, the big thrust uh, has been towards protection and preservation. Um, uh, we urge people, if you have concerns about sites on your property, or you know of, of things that are, are in danger or need protection, or you just want advice, um, we're here as resources. This is what we've been trained to do. We care about the past. We care about the past for all publics, all diverse publics. And so we want to help facilitate the protection and preservation of that past, but also a, a means of learning about it. And so we've been really great, and I want to get, I give a, a special thanks as well to uh, our collaborators, uh, not just with the Seneca Nation, but also Jeff Daly and Dwayne Havard of the uh, French Creek Historical so excuse me, the French Creek Council, Boy Scouts of America, who run the uh, Custaloga Town Ranch, as well as uh, William Filson of the Mercer County Historical Society for their support and commitment to protection efforts. Um, there has been mention of things like trail cams, which I hadn't considered, uh, as well as signs and things to, to protect and warn people that the Boy Scouts are serious about protecting these sites. Uh, and I, I think that's, to my eyes, and, and I, I think I can speak for Seneca Nation on this as well, that it's really one of the, the, the highlights for them as well, is to see it protected as people continue to learn from it and appreciate the rich history in the French Creek Valley. Um, this is what we're about. Uh, I have some acknowledgments here, a number of individuals who have been helpful throughout the project. Uh, we love doing this type of talk. Please keep us in mind. Hopefully we'll be invited back, Dave, next year to, to give another talk. Um, we really love and enjoy this stuff. Thank you guys for having us, and thank you for your enthusiasm and appreciation for local history.